Let's hear God's word together now. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Father, uh, would you help us this morning? Uh, please give me clarity as I preach. Uh, Father, help us. Uh, our hearts are so quick to go dull. Uh, to think about a million other things, uh, to not see uh, what's right in front of us. Uh, so, Father, would you please help us and give us grace this morning, we ask. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Author Tim Challies uh, recently wrote an article entitled, If Satan Took Up Marriage Counseling. Yeah. In it, he gives several pieces of horrible marriage advice that are common currency, though, in our society today. Uh, all against God's word, all promising immediate, in-the-moment happiness, but all leading to disaster. One of the pieces of advice that jumped out is this, and again, he lists probably 20. This is one of them. He says, if Satan took up marriage counseling, he would want husbands to be passive in their leadership and wives to be so disappointed in that lack of leadership that they would feel justified in failing to respect their husbands. He would want wives to determine that submission is a mark of weakness, and that if it is given at all, it should be given only when it is earned. He would want husbands to treat their wives harshly instead of gently, and to express constant disappointment rather than delight. In other words, Satan would attack the very truth that the Holy Spirit lays down for us in this passage that we just read. Uh, and in its place, he would, he would feed our natural inclination to look out for number one in different ways, of course, but that's kind of the bent of all of our hearts. And that would feel really good for a while and maybe even bring some short-term payoff if it didn't, nobody would do it. But the story would not be pretty over the long run. And we're now in our second Sunday of looking at what scholars call uh, Paul's household codes. Uh, that, and the most foundational of these codes, in other words, these, uh, these strictures, these descriptions of relationships between individuals, and we're going to see several more throughout the next couple of weeks. The most foundational of these, though, is the relationship between husbands and wives. Now, last week we looked at God's call to wives, uh, the mission, the task that he's given them uh, in their relationships with their husbands in verses 22 to 24. Uh, in a word, the call to wives is to submit to their husband's leadership. Now, unless you get the wrong idea about what that means, I'd encourage you, if you weren't here, go back and watch the sermon on the YouTube channel, and you'll understand better about what is and isn't being said there. Now, today we're going to be looking at verses 25 to 33. God's call to husbands, a call that is equally straightforward. Look at verse 25 with me. Husbands, love your wives. Okay, straightforward, yes. Simple, simplistic, easy, not a chance. It is not because your wives are bad. I know what some of you are thinking. No, no, no. You're going to see this difficult path that God has called husbands to walk is the path to joy. As hard as it is sometimes. And it tells us a lot, a huge amount, in fact, 
about the love that Jesus has demonstrated for his people, the church. So let's break down our call to love under three headings like this this morning. First, the call to lay down your life. Okay, so this is the call to husbands, the call to lay down your life. Second, the call to care. And third, the call to live as one. Okay, so the call to lay down your life, the call to care, the call to live as one. This is for everybody here, whether you are a husband, a wife, or neither of those things here this morning. We all need to hear this. So if you're a husband, it's going to help you know how to live. If you're not a husband, it's going to help you to know how to encourage the husbands in your, in your life, okay, how to live and how to pray for them. So first, here we go with the call to lay down your life. If you watch sitcoms at all over the past 25, 30 years, maybe a little bit longer even, you are familiar with how the husband is typically portrayed in those shows. Uh, he is dumb, slovenly, gullible unkempt, inept, lazy, and about as romantic as a two-by-four. Think Homer Simpson repeated ad nauseum. He wants to be left to himself, hanging out in his man cave or in his garage or down at the pub, uh, removed from the rest of the family except when he makes an occasional appearance to come around for his own purposes. Or, on the other hand, and this is not so much in the sitcoms, it is like in the dramas that maybe you've watched. The husband is often domineering and tyrannical and abusive. All right, we've seen both of those pictures a million times. Maybe you've seen them in real life, but you've certainly seen them in the arts. And unfortunately, there is some truth behind both of those stereotypes. Uh, ever since Adam abdicated his duty and honor to protect and love his wife in Eden, and then blame it on her when everything goes south, husbands have had the tendency to care more about themselves and their comfort, whether that's through checking out or through oppressing, than they have uh, caring for and loving their wives. This was definitely the case in the Roman world that Paul was writing to. In many cases, uh, husbands used wives only for children, uh, for housekeeping, for maintaining order around the home in order to improve the husband's prestige, his name in the community. And in the meantime, he would pursue his other vocational, social, and romantic interests away from the home. So against this cultural narrative, uh, the term, the terms that Paul lays out, this call for husbands, I mean, it hits with the force of a sledgehammer. Look at verse 25 again with me. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, let's take this a piece at a time. Paul begins by saying, husbands, love your wives. Now, other philosophers, other ethicists from the ancient world, from Paul's time and even centuries before that, uh, would, have, would have sometimes agreed that husbands were supposed to love their wives. For instance, one writer said this, Love your wife, for what is sweeter and better than when a wife is lovingly disposed to her husband into old age and husband to his wife, and strife does not split them asunder. Another writer said this, In marriage there must be above all perfect companionship and mutual love of husband and wife, both in health and in sickness and under all conditions. But here's the trick. There are four words for love in the Greek language, okay, four different terms for love. One is eros, okay, so that's where we get the word erotic from, so that's, that's talking about romantic or sexual desire. Then you have storge and phileo. Those are both love related to love between uh, friends, so phileo, phila, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Okay, so that word and then storge, those are friend love or family love, like you may have for a sibling, aunt, uncle, whatnot. Uh, those words, so eros, sorge, phileo, those were the words, or, or similar words, uh, were used in the instructions of those writers that I read just a moment ago, and other ancient writers. But here's the trick. The fourth word for love, agape, that word became the watchword for early Christians. This is a love of a qualitatively different sort. 
According to scholars, agape means love, quote, that is totally unselfish, that seeks not its own satisfaction, nor even affection answering affection, but that strives for the highest good of the one loved. It means not only a practical concern for the welfare of the other, but a continual readiness to subordinate one's own pleasure and advantage for the benefit of the other. It implies patience and kindliness, humility and courtesy, trust and support. This love means that one is eager to understand what the needs and interests of the other are and will do everything in his power to supply those needs and further those interests. Guess which word for love Paul uses in verse 25? Yep, agape, a love that submits its own desires and even needs to those of another. In keeping with Paul's instructions, you remember back in verse 21 that we looked at a couple weeks ago, this call of mutual submission, that believers are to, are to show submission to one another. In other words, they are to serve one another. Some like wives looked at last week, show that, that submission by submitting. Some show it in their leadership by laying down their lives for those who lead, as we're looking at right here. This is the love of laying down your life. To make clear what he's getting at, Paul continues, okay? He says, husbands, love your, uh, love your wives. What do he say that next? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, you know what that means, don't you? You know what that means. Wives are called to submit. Husbands are called to die. Wives are called to submit. Husbands are called to die. If that doesn't make you at least a little bit weak in the knees, you are not understanding what Paul's saying here. You're not. This verse means that you have no right zero, to put yourself first. You're not. You are the leader of your home. Absolutely, we've talked about that. But you are the lead servant as well. Brothers, your goal in marriage is not to serve yourself. Not to serve yourself. That is, of course, true of, of all healthy relationships that you don't go in just looking to serve yourself. But because marriage is the most intense human relationship we can have, this principle is amplified, and husbands are supposed to take the lead in serving. You're not always going to get what you want. Okay, you hear me? Guys, you're not always going to get what you want. Sometimes you're going to have to say no to a night out with your buddies. Sometimes you're going to have to delay a fun purchase that you were wanting to make. Sometimes you're going to be the one to do the dishes, or change the diapers, or stand up with the sick kid. Sometimes it simply means practicing a greater awareness of what's going on around you at a societal level or at the local like physical arena going on around you so that you can have your wife's back, not because she's foolish or naive, but because you are her protector. If there is a bullet to be taken, you are the one to take it. You're the one to make the sacrifices first for your family. You cook a bunch of steaks one night on the Weber, and there's one that doesn't look as good as the other ones, guess what? You better get out to A1, because you're not going to have the best-looking steak. If someone needs to go above and beyond, you're the one for the job. You're not looking to your wife or to your kids, okay? It's you. It's you. You're the tip of the spear. And that's not going to always be fun but it will be good. In fact, in some small way, it's going to be a picture of how much Jesus loves his people. I told this story four or five years ago, and I know we've all slept since then, and most of y'all were not part of the church then anyway, so I'm going to retell it. Uh, Dr. Robert, uh, J. Robertson McQuilkin, he was the president at Columbia Bible College for years and years uh, over in South Carolina. He was a renowned speaker and author. However, that didn't last as long as he would have wanted. Uh, his bride, Muriel, suffered with Alzheimer's uh, for the last 20 years of her life. So this didn't kill her quickly. It went on and on. 
Dr. McQuilkin gave up his presidency and pretty much everything else to care for her and love her during those two decades. He penned a memoir of that time uh, called A Promise Kept. Uh, you, it's available online. He writes this. Once our flight was delayed in Atlanta, and we had to wait a couple of hours. Now there's a challenge. Every few minutes, the same questions, the same answers about what we're doing here. When are we going home? And every few minutes, we'd take a fast-paced walk down the terminal in earnest search of what? Muriel had always been a speed walker. I had to jog just to keep up with her. An attractive woman sat across from us working diligently on her computer. Once when we returned from an excursion, she said something without looking up from her papers. Since no one spoke to me or at least mumbled in protest of our constant activity, pardon, I asked. Oh, she said, I was just asking myself, will I ever find a man to love me like that? If you lay down your life like that for your wife, do you really think that the question of her submitting to your leadership is ever really going to be much of an issue? Probably not. So the first way that husbands love their wives is by laying down their lives for them. Now let's take some time and look at the call to care. Uh, I recently listened to a book called Standing in the Fire by Tim Doyle. Uh, it's a collection of stories from Christians living in parts of the Muslim world where being a follower of Jesus is extremely dangerous. Uh, one of the, the people chronicled in the book was a young lady named Sunni. Uh, she'd been married four or five times, I lost count, and divorced as many. One husband divorced her because she couldn't bear children. Uh, another divorced her because she was vaguely, quote, displeasing to her. Uh, another very wealthy husband turned out to be a sex trafficker and tried to force her into prostitution, so she had to flee. Her life, as you listen to all of these marriages and, and just how every one of them fell apart, it, it sounds a lot like the lives of many, perhaps most, of the wives in the Roman Empire at the time of Paul's writing. Uh, husbands treated wives as disposable and only valuable insofar as they completed their assigned task. And at any moment, a husband could legally kick a wife to the curb and find someone more pleasing to him. Paul, however, is having none of it. He knows that's how, how men and husbands are, that, that's the cultural air that everybody breathes in the empire. He says, no way, no way. Look at verses 29 or 28 and then 29a. So that's the first part of 29. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Okay, before we get into, into what Paul is saying to husbands here, look again at how he builds out his argument. He says, in the same way. Same way as what? All right, back up to verse 26. It says that he might sanctify her. So Jesus sanctifying the church was saying that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now, when you connect those verses back to 25 that we just read, you're going to see the flow of Paul's thought. Jesus gave himself up, went to the cross for the church, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now, sanctify in the Bible means to, to set something apart, okay? To set something apart or someone apart. In the New Testament, that, that word is sometimes used to refer to a process, so sanctification. The Holy Spirit, day by day, making Christians more like Jesus. However, sanctify is used just about as much in the New Testament to refer to a one-time event. God setting us apart for himself through the Spirit's power when we come to faith in Jesus. That's how it's being used here. And how did he sanctify his people? Okay, so how, how does Jesus sanctify his people? Look back at the text. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now, some scholars think that water reference is a reference to baptism, though it's more likely that Paul's using that phrase, washed with water, washing with water metaphorically, because he does the same thing elsewhere over in 1 Corinthians, for instance. 
it's an image of cleansing, okay, that both Jews and Greeks would have been familiar with, uh, both from ordinary life, of course, using water to clean things, and from religious practices in both cultures. So the key phrase here is really that, that last phrase, with the word. With the word. What word? When the context, the gospel. The gospel. The good news of what Jesus did for sinners. So through people hearing and believing the gospel, they've been cleansed of their sins and set apart and declared righteous because of what Jesus did for them. It's a description of a sinner being saved, being rescued. And that salvation is going somewhere, okay? So this isn't esoteric. It's not just a kind of a piece of theological data for, you know, trivial pursuit night. It's going somewhere. Look at verse 27. Why did he do that? Why did he, why did he sanctify the church to himself, okay? So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So the whole point of what Jesus does here it is, to, is to facilitate this relationship between himself and his people. So I can still remember the day that, that we got married. Um, now, I know you're not supposed to see the bride before the marriage. Where we, we didn't do that. We took pictures beforehand. Okay, so uh, we saw each other before the wedding. But So I can remember, though, early in the day, seeing Erica, and man, she's all ready. It's like 9, 10 in the morning. She already got her hair done. The wedding's at like 3 o'clock or something. She already got her hair done. And makeup, so man, she just looks stunning already. And uh, and so, you know, she spends all day doing that. Hey, like getting ready, and then her friends come and they like eat lunch while they're trying to eat around lipstick and all that. And you and all that. and I mean, it's just it's wild. Like it's this big party of getting ready. We're all familiar with that in our culture. And look, in our culture, we don't do it up nearly like Middle Eastern culture, where you might spend like weeks getting ready for the wedding. Okay. It's a concept that we're familiar with, all right? Here, though, here, the groom is the one preparing the bride in order to present her to himself. She can't make herself beautiful for him. You see that? She, she can't do it. She can't do it. It's something only he can do for her. Point is, there's not enough morality, there aren't enough good works that we can do to make ourselves presentable to God. That's why Jesus came to save us, not just to give life tips. Okay? He came to make us beautiful for himself. See, here Paul is borrowing an image found way back in Ezekiel chapter 16. There's a fair chance that when you're reading Paul's letters and there's something that you just don't quite understand, fair chance he's quoting from something in the Old Testament. Okay? Because not the Old Testament is enigmatic. It's just that it's, it's several millennia older, okay, in places uh, than the New, and it's, it's a different culture. And so Paul's actually pulling something from Ezekiel chapter 16. There, uh, God describes how he found Israel desperate and weak and headed toward death in slavery, right, in Egypt. He takes her in, and he loves her, and he beautifies her, and he makes her his own. Paul's saying here that God in the flesh, Jesus, has done the same thing now with his church, but there's a key difference. In Ezekiel, the bride, Israel, was faithless and actually used her beauty as a weapon to run away from God. She used it to run to other lovers, other gods. Okay? The church, however, by the Spirit's power, continues to stay true to Jesus. Jesus makes his bride holy and without blemish, a beauty that's only going to be fully revealed on the last day. He spares no expense to provide the tender care, the affection that she needs. This is the hope for God's people as individuals and corporately. Not that we're good or strong or perfectly faithful, our hope is that we are the object of our Savior's care for us. And it's this picture that's to inform how husbands are to care for their wives. Let's start again, verse 28, and now we're going to go through 30. Look back at your text with me. 
In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Okay, Paul's about to explain uh, the husbands and wives constitute one flesh. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. So he's reasoning for a husband to love his wife is in a very real sense a husband loving himself. Guys, my guess is that you are at least somewhat partial to your body, okay? Uh, yes, there are men that commit self-harm, and, and none of us do as good a job caring for ourselves as we could, but Paul's, again, speaking of normal human experience here. And our normal experience is that we take care of ourselves, at least to some extent. We jealously guard our own welfare. We eat healthy food on occasion. Uh, we drink plenty of water, we exercise, we bathe, I hope. Uh, we groom ourselves, we nourish and cherish ourselves. And Paul says that's how we're to care for wives, with that same commitment as we do to ourselves. Not with crossed arms, not with complaints, not with half measures, but willingly and joyfully and gently. Husbands, I have never once. I've talked to a lot of hurt wives in my life. I've never once heard a wife say, you know, my husband loves me too well. I sure wish he wouldn't nourish or cherish me with such care. No, every husband has work to do in this area. But what does this entail practically? What does it mean for you to care for your wife? Uh, this list is by no means exhaustive because caring for your wife can take a thousand different forms, but this will at least provide a framework for us. All right, so guys, if you've been tuned out, I need you to tune back in for a minute. Okay, three things. First, it means you don't reduce your relationship to a transaction. You don't reduce your relationship to a transaction. Uh, Sunni, who I discussed a moment ago, the young Muslim lady, uh, had all of her physical needs met, especially with the sex trafficker who was extremely wealthy. Uh, I, I've counseled more than one woman uh, who has driven a very nice car, lived in a big, beautiful home, and had husbands with fancy job titles and six-figure incomes. But these wives were miserable because their husbands didn't really care about them as people their physical care that these men provided wasn't really an outpouring of love. It was simply a transaction. It was almost kind of like rent a wife. It was like, I'll just give you all these things so that you give me the things that I want. Okay. By all means, husbands, provide for your wives, of course, but don't let the physical provision part be a substitute for actually loving them as people. Second thing is this. Caring for your wife means that you know her and what she needs. That you know her and what she needs. Now, look, that may sound like a no-brainer, but this is a continual process, and some guys just aren't very good at it. Uh, in fact, a lot of guys probably know more about their favorite sports teams or hobbies than they do about the day in, day out of what their wives experience and think and feel. Guys, we should constantly be learning about our wives. And remember, they're like us, they change. So just because you think you knew a lot way back then doesn't mean things might not have changed now. I once heard a speaker say that men should constantly be working on a PhD in their wives, a lifetime of study. So we think, we pray, and we plan, and we have to outright ask our wives what they want, what they need, what they dream about what they fear. Look, that can be as mundane as, you know, I really do want hardwood instead of carpet in the bedroom. To as far-reaching as, I'm afraid I'm not going to be the grandmother I should be. And doing this, guys, listen. Again, tune in. Because uh, I, I know you're probably zoning and thinking about 40 other things by now. Don't do that. This is important. Doing that, the things I just said, is going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you effort for date nights, for trips, 
or taking those times away when you can really just sit and be. It's going to take time and focus to actually listen and not just nod or not just try to fix it three words into the sentence, okay? It's going to take commitment and wisdom to respond to what you hear in a godly fashion. Look, I don't do all those things well either, and I'm guessing you don't. I mean, that's what we got to be working on. That's what we got to be working on. Third thing, caring for your wife means that you are making your wife better. You're making your wife better. Because of the leadership you model and the safety you provide and the atmosphere that you help create in your home, your wife is growing in maturity, in grace, in love for Jesus and others. She is becoming better because of her relationship with you, not in spite of her relationship with you. Now listen carefully. This one can be tricky because we're all mixed bags. Uh, You are both a good influence and a bad influence on virtually everyone you know. That ought to humble every one of us in here. Okay? Should encourage us as well. So I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm talking about a general trend of your wife becoming a better woman for being married to you, and not just because she's getting a lot of practice at patience. Okay? I'm talking about more than that. All right? Furthermore, you may know, though, guys, you may be sitting here, and you may know you've blown it. Your wife has not gotten better because of you. Okay? Own that. Own that. Today is the day to repent and know that God loves working through repentant men who are prone to mess things up. He has a great track record of doing that. Okay? If you need to apologize to your wife about some things, do that today. At least schedule the time. Hey, babe, we need to go out for, for supper uh, later this week one night. I just, need to, I just need to talk to you about some things. Make that commitment today. Don't sit on it. Don't sit on it because you won't do it. But make the commitment today. And get one or two godly guys around you to help you walk and be the man that God's called you to be. Okay, that's just a bit of what it means for husbands to care for their wives. So, husbands, how are you going to apply those things? in your relationship. Don't let this stay abstract or vague. Look, good ideas die the death of vagueness every day. Don't don't let this stay vague. Be concrete. How are you going to walk in these things better? Okay, now as Paul wraps up this text, he takes us again from the height of theological profundity down to the street level of where husbands and wives relate. Let's look at that now briefly. Look with me again, verse 29. The call to live as one. Let's look at that last phrase. For no one ever hated his wife, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Did you catch that? Just as Christ does the church. No matter where Paul takes his conversation with husbands about their duties to their wives, he never gets very far from discussing Jesus and his people. He knows that that's the key for how husbands should love their wives. So it's important that we understand what he says next in verse 30. Because we are members of his body. As he said earlier in this letter, and he keeps coming back to it in his other writings, Paul keeps driving home this metaphor of the church being united to Christ, being one with him. We are his body. Look, if you're a Christian who knows much of the New Testament, or even if you're not a Christian and you've just been around church a lot, you've probably heard that said, and it's really easy to grow numb to that reality. But listen, the church isn't simply a group of Jesus' followers. Uh, with him as some guru sitting up on a mountain, cross-legged and remote, like we might envision with an eastern guru. No, he identifies himself with us. That's why when Jesus confronts Saul on the road to Damascus, remember what he says to him? So Saul's been persecuting Christians all around Judea, up in Galilee. What what, what, What does Jesus say to him? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not my people, me. What you're doing to them, the same thing is doing it to me. That's what Jesus is saying. See, we aren't him, and he isn't us, okay? So there's still, he's still God, and we're still not. But we are connected in a way that defies verbal 
description. So to help illustrate this, Paul calls forward the closest analogy there is to this kind of unity. Not the, not the relationship friend to friend, not the relationship parent to child. Only one relationship that even gets close to this. Verses 31 and 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So here's what's going on here. Jesus' connection with, his relational oneness with his church provides us with the foundational picture of how husbands are to view their relationship to their wives, and in turn, the unity that a husband and wife share are to be a mirror, imperfect as it is, a mirror of the way that Jesus loves his people. So men, do you, do you see how important it is how we love our wives? It's literally a 3D picture of the gospel. It's supposed to be. How we treat our wives. People are supposed to be able to look at that. Our children, our neighbors, everybody around us is supposed to be able to look and, and in some small, again, imperfect and limited way, say, okay, that it's what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about how Jesus loves his people. Like I said, this is high, high theology. It is a profound mystery, as Paul calls it. But high theology doesn't keep us from the business of living. In fact, it informs it. Verse 33, Paul brings it back down to street level, wrapping up this section. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, it's, it's interesting how Paul nuances this in the Greek, in the original language. Uh, the command is that, and this is real subtle, I would never have noticed in a million years, but it's been pointed out by, by one grammarian in particular. Uh, the, the command is actually a bit softer to the wife than it is to the husband. I mean, wives were in a culture in the first century where they were used to being beaten down and oppressed. They were, just in cultural in general. And so Paul's very clear, hey, respect your husband, follow their lead, submit to them, almost like with the background of saying, look, I know, I know how culture generally treats you. But God's calling you to submit to the loving leadership of your husband. So it's, it's a gentle, respectful reminder. But for the husbands, the way it's phrased in a lovingly, in a loving, brotherly fashion, he is pointing his finger in their chest and saying, every one of you, listen to what I'm saying. Love your wives. Love your wives. In a culture that practically worshipped the status of men and gave them carte blanche to do whatever they wanted, Paul has to be especially direct. Husbands, we are to love our wives as we love ourselves. We are to live as one. This means we think about our wives' welfare continually. We are bound to them at the level of affection, at the level of action, at the level of commitment. Ever since the fall in Eden, men have tended to, to do our own thing, go our own way, to blame the one that God's given us as a companion, our helper, and now God's calling us to go in the other direction, to not walk away from our wives, not to oppress our wives, but to walk with our wives one. Beloved, that's precisely what Jesus has always done for us, for all of us. Though he had every right to walk away from us judicially, right? Every right to walk away from us and leave us to ourselves. He never did. Instead, he loved us by laying down his life for us, taking our sin on himself to the cross. He's loved us by caring for us. By, by nourishing and cherishing us, even when we're fickle and sinful, even on our best days, his care never stops, never fails, never goes weak. He's loved us by living as one with us, filling us with his spirit, identifying with us, committing himself to us in a way that even the best marriages are only a faint, faint glimmer. May God use the love that Christian husbands show their wives as a picture small as it may be, a picture of the way that Jesus loves his people. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you again for this time. We thank you for the call that you've given to husbands and wives. And Father, we pray that you would bless the marriages 
in this church, uh, the marriages of people that we love, and that, Father, you would use uh, our marriages to make us the people you want us to be because we've all got a long, long way to go. And that you would use our marriages as small pictures of what it means for Jesus to love his people. Help us now, we ask. And we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.